Are you looking for the perfect gift for the pro-freedom, anti-woke person in your life? Then look no further than the Spiked Shop. You can now get your favourite Spiked slogan on a t-shirt, hoodie, tote bag or mug, including ban nothing, question everything, love Europe, hate the EU and cancel cancel culture. And if you're a Spiked supporter, you can get a 15% discount on anything. Just go to spiked-online.com forward slash shop to browse our items and make your purchases. That's spikes-online.com forward slash shop. Now, onto the Spiked Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Spiked Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers. Uh, no Tom Slater this week, so we're joined by Spiked's editor, Brendan O'Neill. Hello. And as usual, we have Spiked's columnist, Ella Whelan. Hi. Today, we'll be discussing the fallout from the Batley and Spen by-election. Kim Michelle Ledvita is duly elected. Labour has secured a surprise victory in the Batley and Spen by-election. The pundits didn't expect, the pollsters didn't expect. What a really important Thank victory you. of hope over division and decency over hatred. The result of this election cannot stand. So Labour has held on to Batley and Spen, only just. Kim Leadbeater scraped the contest with a majority of just 323 votes. The Conservatives came second and left-wing firebrand George Galloway came third. Brendan, first off, let's talk about Labour's win. Keir Starmer says Labour is back. Is it really? No, it's not, thank God. Um, I mean, the win is quite surprising, actually, because everyone predicted that Kim Leadbeater would lose, like Labour has been losing lots of Brexit voting red wall seats. So there was that prediction, including by Rod Little on Spike, who staked his life on Labour losing. So that's quite funny. <laughs> Maybe stay safe for the next few weeks. So it was surprising. But the way people are talking about it, the way Labour is talking about it is completely and utterly bizarre. This mm. idea that it was, in Keir Starmer's words, a fantastic victory. And this is a new start. And here we go. Let's let's propel forward. It's a complete fantasy because this was not a convincing victory at all. I mean, Labour's, Labour got its worst share of the vote since this seat of Batley and Spen was created in 1983. It got 35%, which is the lowest percentage of the vote it's ever had, um, including when it was losing that seat to the Tories in the 1980s and, and early 1990s. So it did very badly, a terrible majority of 323, which actually in most normal political universes would make you think, oh, God, this is not a safe seat. Yeah. It could be nabbed in the next election. We really have to pull our socks up. But of course, what Labour is doing is saying this is wonderful and it proves our doubters wrong. So they're deluding themselves. They're completely and utterly deluding themselves. It was a very thin victory. And I think it actually shows, uh, everyone's saying it's bucking the trend of what's happening in red wall seats, many of which are going to the Tories. I actually think it's part of that trend. Yeah. It's just taking place in a more slow motion way than in other parts of the country. Yeah, Ella, what have you made of this? I mean, especially the disconnect between, you know, the excitement over the victory and the, you know, the narrowness of it. Well, it's important to put the word victory into context. I mean, obviously they won, mm. but as John Curtis said on the Today programme this morning, the more important thing is that because of George Galloway and mm. him stealing votes from both Tories and the Labour Party, Labour actually dropped seven points. So they were nearer to the Hartlepool, the catastrophic, historic, terrible result that they had in Hartlepool. So, you know, victory in some ways, but mm. actually on the whole for in the context of Labour Party support in the North, not so great. Uh, they, they, as we, as Brendan already said, they barely scraped by. The fascinating thing that I um, read, and you mentioned this in your column, Brendan, was Keir Starmer saying, it's just the start, <laughs> which <laughs> it's, he was, you know, became leader in April 2020. I mean, if this is just the start, mm. it's mm. a slow start. <laughs> and there's, you know, this kind of willful ignorance around the fact that in particular with the Batley and Spen election, the tactics from the Labour Party wasn't that this was a Labour Party thing. It was actually that it was a Kim Leadbeater thing. Yeah. So much emphasis on her as a local candidate, you know, her sort of flagship policies were around uh, picking up rubbish and speeding um, tickets and roads and all the things that you would expect a good local MP to have. And actually, you know, many people say from both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in hindsight that she was a good candidate and that might be why she scraped it for them. But there was no big picture Labour, yeah. Red Wall, any of that because they knew that that wasn't going to wash. So there's real, there's, can, even after this 
victory, non-victory, there's still a huge amount of disingenuous chatter within the Labour Party. I mean, you've mentioned the leaflets there. We should talk about some of the, I mean, as well as these kind of ultra-local issues, one of the things that really was striking about this, um, you know, by-election campaign was the foreign policy issues that came up. Kashmir, Israel, Palestine. Now, Kim Ledby did you know, for, for whatever reason, shoehorn those things in to um, one of her speeches. I mean, should we talk a bit about that aspect of it, Brendan? Yeah, I think um, I wrote a piece on Spike saying that we're witnessing the implosion of multiculturalism. I really think that's what's happening in Batley and Spen. It's happening in other parts of the country as well. But I think there it's taking on, it's taken on a very visceral form. And what I mean by that is not oh God, it's impossible to have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society. That's obviously completely untrue. The vast majority of people are perfectly fine with having a multi-racial, multi-ethnic society, diversity in that sense. But the problem with multiculturalism in the ideological sense is that it is this celebration of difference, this cultivation of difference, and this essentially shoving people into their own ethnic and religious and racial universes where you just live on your own with your own kind of people and and celebrate your own way of life. That's what multiculturalism has essentially done. And it's really blowing up in a place like Batley and Spen. So we had the Labour Party shamefully trying to stoke up anti-Hindu, anti-Indian sentiment amongst the kind of Pakistani Muslim voters in that area. Some Muslims, not all, of course, some Muslims do have some kind of anti-Hindu sentiments. And Mm. Labour was trying to whip them up with its leaflet demonising Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, and saying that we will do something about Kashmir. And you just want to think, what does the Labour Party have to do with Kashmir? You know, butt out. It's none of your business. That's what I <laughs> want to say. It's none of Britain's business, never mind the, Labour, the opposition parties. Uh, but obviously they're doing that to try to appeal to a particular constituency. Mm. And th- that's because in the multicultural era, and particularly in its intensified form of identity politics, apparently the only way you can appeal to people is through issues that apparently touch upon their own ethnic or religious experience. You can't possibly appeal to them as citizens of the United Kingdom with concerns about class and democracy and the economy and power and the future of the union and all those other political issues. You have to say to them, I care about Palestine and I care about Kashmir. I will um, do something about Modi. So a very, it was like pork barrel politics in Mm. a new form. Pork barrel politics is the old American style of politics where you promise a certain amount of funding to a community in order to get their votes. We have an even more degraded form of that now in identity politics and Labour and some of the other candidates did that in Batley and Spen and I think it was really toxic. Yeah and I mean one one of the striking things about Batley and Spen as well is you could actually see that kind of coalition um, fraying, you know, George Galloway in particular was able to, um, maybe exploit some of the weaknesses in that coalition, you know, particularly targeting, um, Muslim voters. He had a kind of a campaign against LGBT education in schools was a big thing. Trans issues he tried to make, um, a, a big thing out of. And, you know, many of those sort of more socially conservative religious voters, maybe the Labour Party isn't their natural home. I mean, what did you make of that, Ella? Well, uh, actually, it was a fascinating interview by Paddy Hammond and Spiked with George Galloway, uh, in which, you know, Paddy said, you know, you, you, you say you're all for opposing woke culture and all this kind of stuff, but you have, for example, taken a particular position on the Batley Grammar School issue and the mm. teacher there and the response to it. And Galloway came back and said, yeah, well, if I was MP, it would never have happened. It would never have been allowed to have been shown. And he kind of tried to throw this, shade this is at the, the Labour car- Party. This is the uh, cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. Yes, the cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. And, and he basically said, well, there wouldn't have been a problem with me because I would never have allowed it in the first place. You think, <laughs> oh, uh, what a great campaigner for freedom you are. Mm. And he he in particular had exploited that. I mean, the kind of stuff that he said about the Labour Party in relation to Palestine, playing just from a different position, playing that same kind of identity politics tactics. But I mean, there was a really fascinating thing in relation to the Labour Party do I mean fascinating kind of dark and and messy thing that happened where that sort of awful point at which Kim Ledbetter was being sort of followed and attacked by um, individuals about her position on LGBT education in schools and there was this condemnation of it sort of half-hearted condemnation of it from the Labour Party but then they in the same breath came out and said if some commentator said if we lose this election mm. and people say it's because of uh, Muslims and LGBT stuff in education then that's racist and you think you can't even defend your own candidate. There's, it's, there's so much treading on eggshells that no one could actually come out and say what they really thought on that issue. And for the, you know, that particular 
example of the Batley Grammar School is such a, it's not just a local issue, it's become such a um, good example of a wider problem with Labour's obsession with identity politics, as Brendan says, picking mm. a certain side and playing them off each other, that they've left themselves open to actually having no allies because they, they're gut, too gutless to actually even pick a side. You're listening to The Spiked Podcast. I'd just like to take a second to remind you about Spiked Supporters. Spiked Supporters is our new and thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked Supporter and you can get access to a number of exciting perks. Spiked Supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, you can get a discount on all the items in our shop and you can bookmark articles as you browse the website. This is all our way of saying thank you to those of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us. We're really grateful for that. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com forward slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spiked supporters account. That's spiked-online.com forward slash supporters. Now, back to the Spiked podcast. We should stick on the the Batley Grammar School for a sec. I mean, it was striking that actually, you know, we've talked about George Galloway and Labour's response to this, but the Tories said nothing either. There didn't seem to be, there was no mainstream candidate that wanted to have anything to say about this issue, about a teacher who had effectively been disappeared in the United Kingdom. It's really shocking. I mean, in some ways, we've written about it on Spike ever since it happened. We've written about it a lot because we think it's an incredibly serious situation when religious fundamentalists can chase a public servant out of his home and out of his town simply because he showed an image to his school pupils. That's really shocking. And it has kind of hung like a shadow over this whole election. But at the same time, so few people are willing to talk about it. And there was an interview with Kim Ledbetter and the interviewer raised the issue of the Batley Grammar School teacher. And I thought her response was actually disgraceful because mm. she just ermed and awed. She wouldn't give a firm line. You know, of course, she said it's sad what's happened to him. And no, it, this should not happen to anyone. But then when she was told that this teacher feels like he can't come back to the school and doesn't want to teach her again, she said something like, well, that's up to him. I'm sorry, it's not up to him. If you have been threatened with death mm. and you know that your home is not safe and you have a young family, it's not just up to you to if you want to waltz back into the school or not. So a real lack of appreciation for the situation that man found himself in, which is that he was being threatened and abused simply for doing his job as a teacher, which is to teach critical thinking. But the Tories, yes, the Tories failed completely on that front as well. I thought the Tory campaign in Batley and Spen was just laughable. Mm. I mean, really, really pathetic. They just were so aloof and complacent. And they clearly w hoped that the Galloway and Labour would slog it out and that they would accidentally come out top. And that didn't work out in the end. But even the fact that they thought that really tells us a lot about how the Tories view red wall seats. They're yeah. starting already to take them for granted or to think that these are parts of the country they don't have to try very hard to win. So I hope they learn a lesson from this too. Firstly, don't take working class voters for granted. And secondly, if you're standing in a constituency where an actual school teacher has been hounded out by actual religious fundamentalists, you have to talk about it. You have to address that, make it clear what you would do in such a situation and appeal to voters on the basis of freedom and democracy. And um, sticking with the Tories for a sec, you know, do you think this is a broader problem for them, Ella? I mean, you know, obviously they've won the Red Wall, they've won Hartlepool, but, you know, is there a problem of complacency here? Is there this just, it seems to be that they're assuming that these seats will just fall into their lap. Oh, well, certainly. I mean, I had to Google quite hard to remind myself of Ryan Stevenson's name because <laughs> genuinely most <laughs> media coverage of this says Kim Ledbetter and the Tory candidate because mm. he's such a nobody and has made such little impact. And and the Tories stopped him from speaking to the national press and things like that. It was a deliberate kind of, you know, submarine blamed, campaign. And several commentators have blamed that on the, blamed the sort of lacklustre turnout for the Tories on the whole Matt Hancock 
a scandal mm. scenario. But I think that uh, in itself is a kind of complacent view because actually if you look at the constituency of Batley and Spen, and as Brendan says, the working class voters that are living there and the kind of lives that they lived before the pandemic and their quality of life and their access to resources. And during the pandemic, many of them will have been had their lives decimated thanks to a liberal Tory obsession with lockdowns. And it's not just Matt Hancock, you know, kissing around and having an affair that's upset them. It's the progressive attack on social life and jobs and all the rest of it that we've talked about many times in, in this podcast that, you know, has meant that they're very sour towards the Tories. I mean, again, I keep mentioning Curtis because he's a bit of an expert on this, but he said that and sort of upset the Today programme presenters this morning, said actually, no, it's got nothing to do with Hancock necessarily. It's a broader upset with the Tories. And also importantly, which we haven't mentioned that yet, Brexit still hangs over yep. this. And it's not just that uh, voters will be pissed off with the Labour Party as they were in Hartlepool and other areas, but that you know, despite the pandemic, and despite the Tory having this kind of excuse for being sort of on holiday from politics with a capital P over the last 15 months, the failures around that with with Boris Johnson and the Tory party will also sting. So it was completely ridiculous for them to think this was going to be a walk in the park. Brendan, final thoughts? This election, this by-election has really taught us a lot about where British politics is at. It's told us that the Labour Party's troubles are going to continue, carry on for a long time, and I think they're going to get worse, in fact. And anyone who says this is a turnaround for them is just t- t- being delusional. <laughs> um, we know now that the Tories are a bit clueless when it comes to the red wall seats and what to do with them and how to appeal to them. Um, and I think that could fracture quite soon, especially because the Tories are now rolling out their levelling up campaign to level up the regions with the rest of the country, there's a big question mark over what that means. Does it just mean throwing a bit of money here and there to build a new art gallery or something? Or does it actually mean taking these people seriously as citizens of the country who should have a say in how the country is run? So uh, I think the people of Batley and Spen are not convinced by levelling up or by the Tories. So we'll see how that pans out. And then, but I think the, the Galloway thing is quite interesting as well in terms of what it tells us about politics. I thought I thought Galloway behaved terribly after the Modi leaflets came out from the Labour Party because he essentially put out a statement saying, well, I was against Modi before the rest of you. And you just think that's not the point. It really gets on my nerves when people, I mean, Modi was, whatever you think of him, he was elected by 230 million people. Mm. I mean, the largest act of democracy in human history. And he means a lot to Indian people. So that Modi bashing that blew up in the election was absolutely surreal. But What I think Galloway might point at, probably accidentally, because he's not the greatest political strategist of all time, is that there is scope, I think, for new voices and new parties that are anti-woke, sceptical about trans issues, culturally conservative. I hate that phrase because it's not quite right, but culturally conservative in the sense of not wanting kids to be taught about LGBT and not wanting to be told constantly that Britain is a horrible country and everything like that. The thing that was interesting about his campaign is that it probably did appeal to people beyond the Muslim constituency and people who were looking for a leftish voice, but one that was different to the woke stuff that has become the dominant strain in left politics. So that's an important lesson too. But in the round, I think it demonstrates that British politics is in a pretty bad state the divisiveness of identitarianism is spinning out of control. And unless we have some serious humanist alternatives soon, things could get a bit worse. Thank you for listening to the Spiked Podcast. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, make sure you keep up with all the latest from Spiked by signing up to our daily newsletter today on Spiked. Just go to spikes-online.com slash newsletters to sign up now.